the point made by Asperger that you need his tra the traits of his syndrome to do well in the sciences and in the arts. And what is so important for us to understand is the potential value of the more able people in the spectrum, what they can um, contribute to life, and how we can help them do so. That's really the big question that's really got to answer. How we can make use of their very positive attributes. Nobody who doesn't understand autism and really knows what it feels like and what it's like to be inside an autistic person, that sort of person can't design a decent way of helping. Um, you, the first thing that needs to be done is to understand the individual that you're dealing with and to know what are their skills and what are their disabilities because one of the ways in which um, um, you get the cooperation of the person concerned is if you um, help them to use their skills and interests. You need to understand what interests them and use that as a basis for interacting with them. Um, rather than concentrating on the things that they do wrong and the things that are a problem, concentrate on what they enjoy and what they really like doing. And um, you need to have a picture of the whole person with their skills, disabilities and so on and their interests and all that. And start by trying to plan an environment for them um, which is very predictable, very organised and in which they feel comfortable. And you need to um, provide information in a visual way um, so that they, because um, they, visual presentations tend to be much better understood than any other variety, so that you, you build up this, um, this world which is comfortable and enjoyable and reassuring for them. And then little by little you take each little bit and try to expand their ability to um, engage with this particular aspect and <coughs> find ways to make them feel more comfortable to expand their, their skills and abilities in that, in that area. The reason I got interested in um, working in the field was because I had a, a daughter with autism. Although she's a, she was a female and, you know, the, less common in them, she had classic Canner's autism, absolutely classic. And, I mean, I thought that was what autism was like across the board. They, all the autistic people had Canner's syndrome. Uh, I can't remember why it happened, but um, I did um, uh, get hold of um, Asperger's first paper, written in 1944. Now, I couldn't, it was in German, I couldn't understand German, didn't learn it at school. But my husband, um, John Wing, he, he uh, learned um, German at school, and he read it to me, translated it to me. And um, I was, uh, we were absolutely fascinated by what um, Asperger was writing. And I had seen a few people who fitted his descriptions. And that's what really got me very much involved. And of course, um, as you know very well, um, Judy and I did a study. Uh, he, we found the same sort of, around, around the same um, prevalence as him. And, um, but then, um, by the time we'd finished the study, um, I had, uh, John had read um, Asperger's paper to me, and we had seen some individuals, um, we were asked to see individuals at the Maudsley Hospital who were inpatients there, and sometimes we were asked to, to see them, and, and some of them fitted Asperger's descriptions. It was much more common to have autism and a high, higher IQ, an IQ over 70, right up to genius level, than to have an IQ under 70, three or four times as common. And that was really the beginning of all this, wasn't it? Yeah. That's why I, the whole view of it has changed. My, the real influences in my um, career in, in autism has been Lorna, who, who was the first book that I read on autism, and actually people with autism themselves, where we've learned so much um, about 
people's different experiences. So, to introduce uh, to you Sue Mokai, who is an action researcher at the Centre for Investigative Psychology at the University of Liverpool. And Sue is going to talk about emotion, empathy and exploitation. Emotion and empathy in women with autism, but in the context of exploitation. Because in the context of exploitation, those vulnerabilities are um, perhaps made more visible. The issues and perhaps the background um, in which emotional exploitation occurs. But I think women with autism, I think uh, Sarah Hendricks write this incredibly well, was women with autism, um, like all women, are sort of seem to be predisposed to be interested in people and understanding people. Women with autism are no different and it cause, can cause them untold distress because they can't understand um, other people often, particularly they can't understand other women because women are especially complex socially and emotionally. Um, and because they can't understand them but they're predisposed to want to understand them, it causes them all sorts of distress. That makes them vulnerable. Empathy, um, there are many definitions of empathy. And I think empathy is probably as an elusive uh, construct, probably as intelligence. There are myriad of definitions of empathy. Online, Tony Atwood um, said, many women with high functioning autism are very successful working in jobs such as librarians, teaching in early years or special needs, social work, psychology or counselling. If you look for advertisements for jobs <laughs> in special needs, Teaching in early years, social work, psychology or counselling, <laughs> I think that E word, that empathy, is going to be in that advertisement. Information is in different types of empathy. Now, situational empathy um, is really about in the moment, here and now, real time, having a feel for what's going on in the other person's mind because you understand how um, another person would feel in the situation they're in. That is situational empathy. Um, and this dispositional empathy, which is something quite different, that's perhaps more, um, might also be described about caring, having a disposition to care. That's something quite different. That's a stable personality trait. But it is a um, component of empathy, nevertheless. Um, and uh, Rogers describes empathy as a multi-stage process. So he suggests that empathy is something perhaps more akin to um, the, almost the basis of a relationship, where it's an iterative process where somebody gradually develops an understanding of how the other person feels. Now, they're all very different definitions of empathy. I would suggest that all women with autism are um, high on dispositional empathy and I actually think because women and I, I'm talking this is a, a hypothetical position now I ought to emphasize this is this is not uh, from research but it seems to me that women with autism because women are predisposed to need to empathize with other people but to, to understand other women they will make up for it with dispositional empathy that makes them potentially very vulnerable because opposites attract the opposite of somebody um, like these women with autism is somebody with high situational empathy and low dispositional empathy, which is your fraudsters and psychopaths. Opposites attract. Women with autism are especially vulnerable. This is really worrying and this is, I think, the the baseline hypothesis of my research in terms of finding out the cognitive mechanisms for how exploitation of um, people with autism uh, works. DSM system and the ICD system were um, developed by, com by committees and um, the, the saying that I like is um, a camel is a horse designed by a committee. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I think committees are the worst sorts of people to <laughs> produce these things yeah. but um, the idea that you can exclude anything exclude autism on the presence of any other disability it is not right in fact it's very common very common indeed 
for autism to occur together mm -hmm. with other diagnosable disabilities. I think that in planning what you're going to do with, uh, um, to help a person, um, it's important not to be misled by all the masses of suggestions for things that cure autism, help autism and so on. Such a lot of it about medication or other sorts of approaches. Um, there's little or no support for any of these uh, more outrageous ideas about how to help a person with autism. Basically, the thing to do is to understand them and help them bit by bit to come to grips with the world. And you can only get so far, mm -hmm. but depends very much on the individual how far you can get and their level of ability. Professionals working with people with autism need to really understand what it feels like to have autism and to really um, have an in-depth understanding. And the more understanding of autism, the better the professional will be in terms of ability to look after them. Get to know the person you're dealing with as well as you possibly can. Uh, my name's Carly Jones. I'm an autism advocate. I'm an autistic woman myself. I was diagnosed at 32 years old. It was terrifying because I thought, oh, goodness me, you know, am I going to be misunderstood by social workers and if, if I'm suddenly on this mental health pathway? Um, but that, that, was the, that was the road I needed to take. And I can remember seeing, um, seeing, a, seeing a, 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 a psychologist and um, I said, you know, I don't, I don't really think I've got any mental health issues. I just think I'm autistic. That was quite awkward, actually, because I, I then later got my diagnosis with the wonderful Dr. Judith Gould at the Lorna Wing Centre. And I was, I was supported very heavily by the um, National Autistic Society to gain, to gain that diagnosis. I went to a conference and um, it wasn't just any conference, actually. I made a little short film, autism and the lack of diagnosis for women. And I, I got an email from the National Autistic Society, kind of 2012, 13 time, perhaps. And they said, oh, would you like to come and talk? Um, at, at, our, at our conference. I saw this stage and there was about 400 people watching and, and it was doctors, philanthropists, um, top, top psychologists, all the icons of autism. And, uh, and, I, and I stood up and, and, and did, a, did a speech about um, having autistic daughters and obviously thinking I was and explaining the life journey. And, uh, and there was a wonderful lady um, called Judy, and she introduced herself as Judy, and she was so nice, and she was always asking me if I need a glass of water or a cup of tea, and she really looked after me, and I thought, oh, what a lovely volunteer Judy is, I really like her. Actually, Dr. Judy Gould was in the audience <laughs> of, of, of that, that talk I did, and then we, uh, we, we got together after that, and, um, and I, I, I you know, applied for a diagnosis there. So it absolutely changed changed my life and um it's almost feels a bit <laughs> it almost feels a bit like a life of two halves bef the before the diagnosis and after the diagnosis now dr judith gould is a woman that i had researched for for at least five years i, I had read everything she's ever written Judith Gould. I'm a consultant clinical psychologist and I'm the director of the NAS Lorna Wing Centre for Autism. And in fact, it was Lorna and myself who, in our early studies in the late 70s, uh, yeah, late 70s that we actually produced the idea of an autism spectrum. Because even then, even in those days, we were very concerned about the categorical approach of actually putting people in, people fitting neatly into boxes and descriptions. And life isn't like that. You know, people, people can't be fitted neatly. And to think that we can try and have a, a, a firm diagnosis based on behavior, which is variable, transient, depends on your age. You can have somebody with Canna's autism at three, and then somebody at thir the same person at 13 uh, could be described as having Asperger's syndrome. So, you know, things change over time, depending on the appropriate education, appropriate supports. So, you know, to actually then have diagnostic labels, which is what I would call them, is not useful. 
it's far better to describe somebody in terms of what we use, our terminology is social interaction, social communication, and social imagination. So the point is that everything merges into each other. And we've got a very, our famous saying at the Lawn Wing Centre is that nature never draws a line without smudging it. So I, I appreciate for purposes of research and maybe for evaluating effective treatments, it is helpful to have a common understanding of what autism is. But if we get into detail and then exclude people because they don't fit into that category, then we're doing people a grave disservice. In my clinical work, uh, people might well have been seen by other clinicians, and they themselves, particularly the Asperger group, they themselves have felt that this pattern of behavior describes them and why they're struggling. Uh, but because they've been to see somebody and they haven't fitted into the systems, they've been told, no, you don't have an autism spectrum disorder, or you may even have another diagnosis, which is, again, unhelpful. The formidable British duo who helped cast light on the autism spectrum. It's difficult to overstate the impact that psychiatrist Lorna Wing... And uh, if I were ever asked to present an Oscar for a lifetime achievement in autism, of course, it could only be one person, as I think everybody knows, and it would have to be Lorna. Uh, Lorna Wing is the outstanding, uh, not just lady, but the figurehead of, of autism, and she has been for almost 50 years. Uh, and the fantastic thing about Lorna Wing is that she's always been right about everything. <laughs> and you can't say that about me, you can't say that about other people in the field, but you can actually go back to Lorna Wing's original writings and find that there wasn't really anything she got wrong. She got it all right from the beginning. Um, and the fantastic contribution that she has made to the field, in spite of being right from the beginning, is even more, I think, uh, outstanding because of that. Uh, her thinking has stood the test of time, and we all have to come back to, to Lorna for questions. What is it really like? Uh, what do you think? Uh, if we want... Um, I'm going to ask Lorna that later. If we want a litmus test for what's right in autism, we only need Lorna. <laughs> we can just bring her in and ask, what do you think? And, well, she'll know. And clinical psychologist Judith Gold, PhD, had on the field of autism and autism research. In the early 1970s, the British doctors found their respective lines of work and insights converging in London. Together, they described the triad of impairments, a set of behaviours often found in children on the autism spectrum. Dr. Judith Gold, shining a light on the Overlook. We are very concerned about, and we have a system that Lorna and I have developed, an interview system called the Diagnostic Interview for Social and Communication Disorders. The acronym is DISCO, which interestingly was named by Professor Gilberg when we first began. So it's great hilarity when we do DISCO training for clinicians, professionals, uh, so it's a bit of a joke, but um, it, it, and this, what it does, it trains people to think behind the questions that you're asking to diagnose. If, if we say it's the social instinct. I, I, uh, um, one of my Asperger traits is a great love of animals. And um, I watch a lot of animal programs and seeing the social instinct in animals like lions, mm. the way they are very social together. Yeah and the, the difference between them and tigers, which are not such social mm -hmm. animals. Uh, but, the, so, but tigers love their, their babies, you know, that's, uh, they've got that, that part of the social instinct. Um, and you look through the animal kingdom and into other sorts of um, animals, and you see aspects of social mm -hmm. instinct across the board. It really is a very 
fascinating oh, and absolutely. important aspect of, of life. It leads to their total honesty yeah. and their ability to say anything that's true, despite the fact that it, it upsets other people. Yeah. That sort of thing arises it, from the... Exactly. Yes. Mm. But do you think then that... In fact, actually, some of the repetitive things that we tend to associate with autism should not be in the manuals, like flapping and finger flicking. Or... Oh, it's, it's very difficult to know because it, um, it, you, you see that so much among those children who, with um, more typical classic autism and learning disabilities as well. That's yeah. where you really see that. Yeah. And uh, not so much among the more able ones, although I think some of them do it in private in their bedrooms. I, I think so too. That the more we know about this, um, the, the less we understand it. Yes, I'm uh, afraid that's true. Yes. Because we know so much now about the brain that we didn't do 10 years ago, mm -hmm. and it makes, you know, you, you become, you, you're awestruck when you think about how much we know. Mm -hmm. uh, and the little we know about autism yes. is relatively much less now than it yes. was 10 years yes. ago. Yes, I'm afraid so. So, what do you see then as the essentials in a diagnostic assessment? If you uh, were to say prescribe to all of us, what do you need to do in terms of diagnosing autism? Well, colleagues, particularly Judy Gould and myself, um, what we think is very, very important is to get a detailed history from infancy onwards, if you possibly can. If you've got an informant like a parent, that's fine. With, with adults, it becomes more difficult to find such an informant, but you need to collect whatever you can from the notes that have been written elsewhere insofar as you can and collect what you can from the person themselves. Collect um, across the board so that you get a complete picture of the development of the person concerned. You, their language development, their motor development, their sensory development, everything you can think of, their behavior and so on, so that you've got a complete picture of the way that person um, changed from an infant to an, wherever they are now. Autism occurs in, in different styles, different patterns, and it can occur together with anything else. It can occur together with any physical problem, any psychiatric problem, any developmental problem. Make a proper sort of assessment of a person and to write up a good report on an individual with suggestions for helping them. You really need to understand all the problems that they have and all the skills they've got. The whole lot, you've got to have both. I was just in awe and I couldn't believe it. I shudder to think where I would be now had Dr. Stuart Gould not have taken me under a wing and, 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 and supported me because I've always wanted to try and help people. Um, I, I, was, I failed my degree. I, I kind of ran out of money and, and got divorced two years into it, so I, I, I couldn't finish my degree. But the degree I was studying at kind of 23-ish was, um, was psychology. And, uh, and I did that because I really wanted to help people. I wanted to help people that felt like outsiders. I wanted to help people that felt different. Give, give someone their life back. And, uh, and through advocacy, I hope somehow, in some small way, I've been able to at least do that and safeguard people a bit more. Um, because our, our vulnerabilities are quite vast because we, we can be so misunderstood so misunderstood um, so that put me into um advocate mode now i've got this written on my little notes of bits of paper here um advocate means um a person who puts a case of someone on puts forward a case on somebody else's behalf so although being um, an autistic adult myself really does help in a huge way to being an autism advocate you don't actually have to be autistic to be an autism advocate or an ambassador you need to be able to really understand that person's um, experience and, and, and current needs um, and, and then be able to speak about what, what they need, giving them a voice, a voice to the voiceless.